Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. you hear me all right? Yeah, you sound good. Good. We are going live, everybody. Let's go. <laughs> We're going to go brand. We're going to go countdown. everybody we're back we are back sammy and al back in the saddle back in the saddle after a long break a long break guys um anybody watching this on the replay i've been gone for like a, over a month <laughs> i know sammy's been doing some motorcycling and some traveling hey simon what's up man simon's in the house with the wizard all right simon so yeah, guys. I mean, uh, life is uh, life can be a riddle and a mystery, and sometimes it uh, throws us little curveballs. Sometimes, <laughs> and uh, we won't get into too many details on that. But uh, let's just suffice it to say we are tough, rugged individuals, and we are powering forward and working through uh, life's issues. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's a virus, it's a mask, it's a whatever, uh, whatever life can throw at you. We gotta, we gotta just move forward and power through it. Um, so yeah, man, we're gonna be talking about the Kim Kimbrian Wars. Yeah, um, I was. I, I, I heard some people pronouncing it Simbri, but I was calling it Kimbri. Kimbri, Kimbri. Yeah, those old names. I think it's like it comes from ancient Rome, uh, <laughs> German language or something. So it's, you don't really know how to pronounce it very well, you know. There's so many difficult names in this one. Yeah, it's one of the tribes. Uh, I pulled up my Wikipedia here, and uh, it. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, Cimbrian War, and it's uh, you know one of the tribes. There's uh, several other tribes, and we're talking about you know the Celts and the Germanic tribes uh, that the Romans were fighting. Uh, but uh, before we get too far into this, uh, I guess what we'll do is we will. We will kill a few minutes here, waiting for more people to get into the room. We got two right now, um, and anybody that wants to come in and make comments, uh, I think I gave this like four hours notice, maybe. But uh, yeah, man, uh, kind of fill us in on what you've been up to. I know you've been going to some of the protests. Yeah, I mean, no, I don't want to talk about it too much because it will get you sh this video shadow banned. <laughs> Correct. Yes, we're talking about protesting uh, the lack of milk, uh, vitamin D yes. milk in the United States. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, we've we've both been uh, astray. I'm going to work hard here this next couple of weeks to try to get some more videos made, guys, uh, from here in the studio myself. I know, like I said, I know we've been doing a little bit of traveling and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, well, it's, it's been summer here and everyone's been getting outside, you know. Right. Uh, obviously, now that the nights are uh, drawing in, um, so I think there's gonna be a lot more hobbies going on indoors, as it were, you know. Right, and that's the thing too is you know we've been doing some day trips and some cycling and etc. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, I mean, what I can say is this, and this is uh, something that's made a big impact on me the last month is uh, through YouTube, I've made some great friends, including Sammy here. Uh, and how amazing this is the upside of this technology, guys. There's certainly the downsides, but the upside is you can make friends across the world. And um, I had some guys that have reached out to me over the last four weeks. It started with, hey, why aren't you putting up videos? <laughs> uh, are you okay? Look, guys, that's, that's awesome. I mean, uh, we live in a society that most people are really closed in really don't uh, reach out much to other people but i think this hobby and this platform uh youtube discord has made us uh connect uh guys that have something in common uh war gaming history um and like i've said on other podcasts like attracts like and uh here to support each other through thick and thin, I think is an important thing. Uh, I, I'm thinking of Rocky's War Room. If any of you guys have subbed his channel in the past, 
Uh, he's had some life challenges here recently and he decided to just stop doing YouTube, at least for now. But I know a lot of us guys reached out to him and said, Hey, you know, if you need to talk, here's my cell phone number, blah, blah, blah. Contact me through discord. Um, so I think he experienced the same kind of thing. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's pretty powerful, man. I, I can't believe how many guys contacted me, uh, through discord, uh, sending me well wishes and, uh, encouraging me to, Hey, keep making YouTube videos if you want. So, uh, part of it too is, uh, you know, you just get to a point in life. Would you agree, Sammy? Sometimes you just kind of get burned out. A hundred percent. I mean, you, some of my just kinda, you just kind of need to just take a break from things and try to re, yeah. uh, recalibrate, uh, rethink, uh, where you're going, what you're doing. Um, 100%. And yeah, that's what I've got loads of guys that on YouTube that you know they just dis they disappear for a year and then they'll come back and then we'll put some great videos out. It's just um, it's part of life, isn't it? Really, you, you do get burned out, Correct. especially putting yourself in front of the camera a lot. If you're doing that a lot, you know, like you do. If, if you're not feeling 100, you may you don't really want to kind of get in front of a camera, you know, and act all happy and smiley. All right, that's you just, lose the motivation, and yeah. with it being summer and you want to get outside and do things too, like you said um you can only build so many model kits and paint so many yeah. models <laughs> and then you're like hey i gotta do do something else um yeah. so i think in the future with the content at least on my channel it's going to be mo more podcasting and uh, when i do have group games um i've got a a, a good friend philip coming over uh, uh next saturday this coming saturday we're going to play some napoleonics and kind of just pick through the rules on uh, black powder a little more in depth. Is, he, is he the one with the Macedonian army? Yes. Yeah. And he's going to, yeah, he's going to bring his, uh, he's going to bring his uh, British uh, Napoleonics. And then uh, we're planning uh, October 30th. It's a Saturday. Uh, we're going to do a, a larger game with more guys. So I basically lost August for group gaming. Um, that was flushed, but um we're going to get things restarted here. Uh, we we'll keep things on track uh, as my plan. Uh, the studio has been in limbo. I've not been doing any 3D printing. Uh, I did a little painting. I did do some uh, Star Wars. Here's Stug. Hey, Stug. What's up, man? Hey, Stug. Yep. That sounds result tots. Yep. I, I looked at that in 2019 at Cold Wars. Uh, I got to meet the owner and his wife, uh, the a couple the sweet couple up in um, minneapolis that writes that rule set uh so yeah man uh so stug's another guy i mean uh he's come and gone on the youtubes uh you know going through stuff with life and so i think we all can relate uh to what's going on but i think it uh speaks for the community even though mine is relatively small <laughs> uh so yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was a great, it was a great feeling having that. So, uh, was yeah. was there any uh, upcoming projects you're looking at uh, doing there, Sammy? Any uh, modeling or kits? I just I was getting back into Hell Caesar really. Um, right. Yeah, just get my Romans, get my Romans done. Obviously, I've done my. Uh, oh, my so a boom! I got a tray here. One of my oh, trays. Nice. Yeah, so I, I'm debating how to base them. You know, so I've. It's just how to base them and what sizes, you know. Yeah, we did like uh, we've done these custom bases where I do. I think it's ten dudes, two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah, ten dudes, and this is. I, I think that's. I think that's a good number if you don't want to be, you know, painting loads and loads of models. Right, you know, and this, this way you can, you can make them bigger block units. Like you can make this yeah. a standard unit for the, um, I think that the. The tribal ones in the rule set, they have to be, um, I think they have to be four thick or sorry, four deep or something like that. The basic. Right. Right. So, and then you just take two of those units and put them together. Yeah. And boom. Yeah. It's that's whatever. Easy. This is, uh, th and that's the, the big uh, debate with basing. You know, everybody gets hung up on, oh, it's got to be this many mm -hmm. troops and this size, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's whatever you kind of agree um, with the guys you game with, what, what size a standard unit is, what size a large unit is, because that's how it breaks down. And Hail Caesar is going to be small. 
then there's standard and then there's a large unit. Mm -hmm. And um, there were so many points, which is basically like hit points. Yeah. Um, and then you so just use a dice. It's, it's more the cover, uh, the wide, wideness of the actual base rather than the actual amount of figurines, right? It's, right, because you could, that ten could represent a hundred if you wanted to. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, so and the hit points could be a hundred. Whatever rule set you're using, they all work a little differently. But Hail Caesar is now we use those little glass beads, the little green and red glass beads, yeah. so we can keep track of wounds. That's yeah. what we'll throw next to the unit so that we know how many wounds they have, and then we'll take beads off. That was kind of our way. They were just little glass beads like you buy big sacks of them mm -hmm. on Amazon. I've even, I've, even, I've even seen some people actually use wounded troops, which I think is another cool idea as well, but obviously you got Yeah, yeah, you can use anything. A yeah. post-it yeah. note, you could use dice. Yeah. Um, I've shown you on some of the stuff I have, which have the little counters, which had the master, the magical counter that I got banned from Facebook for. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it had the little twisted cross on there. So that was more for like World War II, but you could use them. I bought some for Napoleonics. I bought some French and some British ones. Um, mm -hmm. So that we're going to be using for our Napoleonics now for keeping track of our wounds. So, yeah, that's kind of in the works here. I've got some out here on the paint table. I've got three French commanders I'm finishing up for this coming Saturday. So I have them finished. They're like half painted. Um, I've done some Star Wars. I've done some Legion stuff. I got C-3PO and R2-D2 painted. Uh, some terrain pieces painted, more terrain. It's just getting motivated, man. Uh, I, didn't think, I, didn't th uh, I didn't think C-3PO would actually be a... Uh on the table. I didn't think it'd actually be a usable yeah, unit. <laughs> really, uh, it comes down to them and they come with a crashed pod like they do yeah. with uh, New Hope. And they're kind of like more like an objective, right? Gotcha, like you're yeah. going to go rescue them or, you know, <clears> you're <throat> right. part of your scenario, right? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, they're not really going to be much use. I guess he could probably, uh, yeah, the, the deadly C3PO. Yeah, he could, uh, he could maybe try yeah. to hit you maybe. <laughs> I don't think that will work too well, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, we're going to talk about the Symbrian wars. Uh, I, I'll, I guess I'll kind of get it, uh, Symbrium, Symbia, whatever you want to, however you want to pronounce that. Um, so it's a, a period of time, which to me, uh, most powerful character in the game. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, to me is uh, Gaius Marius, and that's uh, one of the uh, characters that uh, Sammy wanted me to pick up on here. Uh, this, the Cimbrian, Cimbrian Wars were, uh, let's see here, we'll go down through initial Roman defeats. So let's go through, uh, now this is also the period of time where the Roman army had some serious losses too in yeah. some of these battles where they were just basically crushed. Um, because they figured out that the Germanic tribes weren't pushovers. Well, I think they'd, they'd come into contact with some of the Celtic tribes before. I think this is the first time they probably came into contact, you know, and clashed in a campaign against the um, the uh, Germans, German tribes. Right. And obviously, then, um, in Julius Caesar's time, or, or, you know, which comes after this, they, you know, they have regular, and, and the, you know, the emperors after that, they had regular clashes with the with the German tribes, you know. All right, and it uh, says here that the the tribes were uh, Kimbri, the Kimbri, yeah. um, which you know they must beg uh, the Kimbrian War. So that's uh, strange name, isn't it? But I think they came from one day Denmark, that sort of region. Mm -hmm. Well, they they call it Jutland, and then uh, there was a, another few smaller tribes of them, and no one really knows why they left Denmark, but it was either due to flooding, or it was due to like you know really cold winters. Um, and I think previously they'd, they'd only really kind of migrate south in the winter times to trade their goods with other tribes, but they generally, um, you know, weren't really too migratory. They were kind of staying in the area for a long time. And then, um, <clears throat> oh, we've gone offline. So that's, I, that's, that's hard to believe. I'm seeing, I'm getting a good connection. Maybe, maybe not. Um, might, be, might be Simon's side. Might be on Simon's side because I'm seeing that I'm still streaming. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, Otherwise, it says in broadcast. Um, yes, yeah. it seems good to me. It not seems live. Yeah, but it looks like they went down, kind of uh, into kind of Germany, one day Germany, and it seems like they joined up with the uh, is it the Teutons? Um, yep, Teutons. Mm. 
Um, let me and see. They kind of, and they seem to kind of migrate then south together. So, so there must have been either a lot of flooding or a lot of bad weather up there, you know, because it wasn't just uh, sending an army down. It was the whole nation, you know, so women, children, baggage train, everything, you know, a whole nation on the move. So it, it was a proper migration. Yeah, it says here the Kimbri, the Teutons, the Ambrones, and the Tigurini, who migrated from Jutland Peninsula into yeah. Roman controlled territory and clashed with Rome. Because, yeah, that could have been, hey, that could have been uh, climate change. Yeah. That could have been, we'll that was Roman too. climate change. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's an interesting point. See, so, uh, you know, when all these uh, eras, we play in weather has a huge factor in the different battles. Let's think of uh, Waterloo. Uh, they think that the weather in that basically decided the outcome of that. So, yeah, I mean, uh, just think they were having some sort of uh, climactic thing going on. They got colder or whatever, and they came mm. down further south and started rubbing elbows with the Romans. Yeah, and I think uh, so. First of all, they went into modern day. Czech, I think it would be Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, I can't remember what the modern name for, it, name for it is now. And uh, there was a quite a big tribe called the Boyai. Uh, they come up a lot in history in different periods. And they were, I think they, they tried to muscle their way through that territory and just kept getting rebounded, rebuffed, which is quite surprising considering the size of the, the people in this kind of army. So they kind of then skirted around Czech Republic and then they kind of came, they were getting, then they're kind of going on the north of the Alps there. And there was a tribe they came in touch with who were kind of trading partners with the uh, Romans. Uh, not, sure if, not sure if they're quite allies, but they've certainly supplied them with um, metal working and salt. So the Germans relied on salt so, you know, so much. Um, and they were paid in salt too. Yeah. So that was a kind of a, an area where na- lots of natural salt was around. So they ended up... Um, Trying to find the name of the tribe they ran into there. Sorry, one second. If I can get up here, but oh, yeah, well, this comes back to the scenarios you can create out of all these possible games you can do, guys. Um, like I've three D printed some huts and trees and things like that, and you can come up with all different kinds of scenarios with villages and Romans attacking villages and uh, various things you can. F- two on two, like we do here in the gaming hall where you have a really big battle like we did recently with the Macedonians. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all kinds of possible scenarios here, guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think they, um, so yeah, the Rome, what happens, the Romans showed up to help out their allies and then, um, the Romans pretty, you know, had a show of force and they pretty much said, you know, look, this is our territory. What we'll do is, if you want to retreat, we'll show you. Uh, we'll send some um, guys with you and show you the ways out of our lands. And um, so the the, the, the Simbri and the Teutons have kind of gone. Oh, okay, we'll leave. Um, and then they've started making their way out of the area to the north, going back up north. And uh, they somehow they got wind that, that the Romans are actually planning to ambush them or betray them. So you know that they ended up keeping all their swords and, and on them and actually counter ambushed the romans uh, i think they killed twenty thousand romans and the weather suddenly changed into a storm uh, which allowed the uh the roman the roman general to retreat with some of his troops but yeah it was a pretty bad kicking you know with twenty thousand getting lost there in one afternoon by the sounds of it right and then uh, that, yeah, so that was the battle of Nori- noria or something in in 112 BC. So that was the first clash. Well, and that's what, uh, and it said in the pull up that I'd had here. Well, we'll just go back to Marius uh, Gaius here. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he came in as a, as a problem solver. Um, yeah. Like a lot of us men, we like to fix things and make and you know, solve problems, at least some of us. Um, and, this guy is Marius. He was the first one that came along and let's talk. Uh, if you want to go ahead and we were talking the other day on the phone about uh, what uh, the militia that they had, which was uh, very interesting, similar to what we would say were like the Minutemen. or uh, you want to comment on that? Uh, so he's talking about the, um, the state of the Roman army before Marius came along. Correct. 
yeah so um after that battle i mentioned there was, there was about two or three other defeats um so at this point um i think marius was still fighting down in new media in the when the war in africa which was north africa was taking quite a long time so i think yeah eventually after the terrible well the worst defeat in roman history where they lost something like 80,000 to 120,000 troops um, by being surrounded. They, they, they said, right, let's call in, uh, let's call in Marius, you know? And yeah, so I think they, they had their army was structured before where you can only join the, um, the, the Legion if you had land. Um, Correct. And then, yeah. So then, and then you had, you know, the cavalry, the equite, they were at the, at the buy all their own equipment. So the more equipment you could afford pretty much decided, you know what kind of job you'll be doing and then you right. had this you had the Hestati, which were kind of um the the younger troops less well equipped then you had uh the principe which will have usually a little bit better armor because they they'd fought a campaign maybe pick some uh you know pick some off the battlefield uh maybe they'd sold you as four better weaponry later in the, later on in life and so they had a few more experience if the Hestati couldn't weren't doing very well. They'd retreat behind the uh, Principe. The Principe would go in and uh, finish off the enemy. And as a last resort, you'd have the Triarii at the rear, who would be the the most well equipped and hardened soldiers. Um, and I think, and then they had obviously each kind of alternative of the legion. There, they had they had um, their velites, their spear throwers, you know, and they'd have a small amount of cavalry. You know, with with every, so I think it was about ten thousand men, something like that. Well, I can't remember the, the number, but it was quite a large force, you know, and uh, they weren't professionally trained. Uh, some were better trained than others. They didn't have all the same equipment. Um, so, and then obviously after all these defeats, you you, you know, you, you're killing off all your landed men. So, and right. they realized realize they needed to raise, they needed to raise some troops fast. You know? Yes. So, yeah, so that's so where these, these reforms allowed, allowed them to do that, you know? Right. So it changed the whole, whole system of the army. I don't know if you want to talk about some of the changes you made or if you want me to jump in. Well, yeah, it's just uh, it, that's when we, uh, well, it may have been uh, the Greeks had some of this going on back in the Greek periods uh, where they had also like militia, a lot of the Greek city states. So I think uh, Rome, the Romans had emulated a lot of the Greek uh, structure, government structure, things like that. They had borrowed things from them. They kind of did that in most cultures. And they started realizing when they were going up against um, some armies that they went up against in North Africa were full-time armies. Um, and so then you get into the conscripts and then just regular troops that were full-time. And that's uh, another impact that as that system became adopted, thanks to Marius Gar uh, uh, Gaius Marius, is uh, that's when the roads and the bridges, because when they weren't at war, they put the, the full-time soldiers to work making and building things. So that's a whole thing that started um, from, this, from this point. Like uh, Sammy said, they were getting their butts kicked. And they realized, hey, we can't keep losing the good people in the society. So what we're going to do is we're going to recruit from the lower echelon of society. It'll be like a status symbol. We'll provide them with the armor, with the swords, with their uh, pylums and helmets. And that was the beginnings of uh, the Roman uh, full-time military. Um, and they would have barracks. They would have areas outside of cities where they would be quartered. Uh, so then that also brings about an entire system like we have today of you have to have like a Pentagon, you have to have a, a building in Rome that that administers everything for the military. So you got feeding them sandals, uniforms, et cetera, et cetera. So it started uh, really be becoming an entire industry in the Roman Empire. And as they matric matric matriculated, that's a fancy word for once they absorbed you like the Borg, right? From Star, from okay. Star Trek, they would attack you. They would convert you back into the, the military and they would roll you just like uh, uh, the gladiator. You know, he was Spanish. And uh, once they conquered those guys, they just rolled them into the Roman army, right? 100%, yeah. Hundred percent, and if they if they couldn't train you up 
you know, to their level, you'd become a um, auxiliary unit pretty much, wouldn't you? Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think one of the biggest changes I read about was um, was uh, they made changes so every legionary could carry his own equipment, you know, which obviously has so many advantages. First of all, you know, you haven't got you haven't got to stop every time if you if you're ambushed and you know jump onto a wagon and get get your pillum out of there and all that and 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 also it doesn't take as long to set you know, set yourself up for for camping because everyone knows their job roles right and I think that that increased the speed in which the Roman army could move quite a lot you know by everyone carrying their own stuff right it 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 lent itself to so much more than just saying, hey, we're going to have a full-time army because there's all of the administration, there's all of the logistical things they had to figure out and moving the men and feeding the men, like you said, and moving them quickly, which is where the, you know, hey, we got to make a lot of really good quality roads um, to move the troops around quickly. Uh, We saw it in the Revolutionary War, the American War of Independence. Uh, Here, it was one of the British military's top tasks was improving the roads in the colonies so they could respond to fires as it were. And that's really what the Roman empire evolved into. And that's what this Cimbrian war kind of turned out to be. It was a fire. They were pushing into new areas, uh, even up into great Britain and the, the natives didn't like that too well. So they had to move troops around quickly to respond. And that's, coming back to our war gaming is getting into these scenario games where you can set up these more elaborate scenarios, these backstories. Mm. When you know this history guys, and you dig into this, you just not Wikipedia. There's tons of sources out there. You could spend hours researching all the things and the different phases of this war too, that went on where you can have all these rich backstories for your campaigns, for your games. Yeah. I mean, there was even a point where it was kind of, we're going for this transition period of, of these changes being made. And uh, there was two armies raised. Marius raised one, and there was um, another kind of, of the o- older elite raised another army. And so he ra- the other guy raised it in the traditional way, you know. So there was a lot of pushback at this time. But um, I think two times in this 10 years, the Romans were, ex- the Roman people were expecting after a couple of, you know, after two defeats and separate places, they're expecting this army just to roll in and just totally invade them. And so, so they were actually panicking and a lot of um, the middle and upper classes were actually jumping on boats, going over to Greece and going down to Sicily, you know, because they just yep. thought they were about to get rolled up. So the Romans were pretty lucky after each of these defeats. If, if the, uh, Germans had just kind of decided to roll on down into Italy, which they easily could have. They, you know, I think Roman Roman history wouldn't have been the same. You know, you wouldn't have had a Julius Caesar, any of that. You know, they no, just- and ultimately, ultimately, that's what ended up happening in the later stages of the Roman Empire with the yeah. vassals and things. He finally, did come in and sack Rome because it was it, wasn't it, or something? The like that. They were like, "Hey, you got to give us gold." And they, if they couldn't cough up the gold, they would come in and they would just take, they would loot and pillage. Mm. Uh, which gave rise to the Eastern Empire uh, as we went over to Constantinople. So um, from there, and then they basically abandoned Rome for the most part. It was just been sacked and destroyed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a fascinating because you realize when I was researching this is all this stuff goes on before Christ. Anybody who's a Christian out there follows yeah. the Christian religion how old all this stuff goes back and all these things that have gone on for hundreds, thousands of years, these types of things, uh, which makes this, these ancient periods of war gaming really fascinating to play as scenarios. Yeah. I mean, I remember one, uh, and also some of the gruesome details, you know, like, uh, so this is it, the battle of Oris, Orisio. So this was kind of the last major battle before <clears throat> they brought in um, Marius. And this was the worst German defeat, uh, sorry, worst Roman defeat in ancient history. So before, I remember you had Can before. <clears throat> so we're going back something like 200 BC when we had Hannibal uh, for the Carthaginians, you know, coming in. And obviously the Battle of Cannae there was a terrible Roman defeat. So this, this one was actually worse than Cannae. 
as I said, you had 80,000 Roman slaughtered alongside 40,000 auxiliary troops slaughtered. Yeah. And, um, and even in the skirmish before this battle, uh, the Romans sent, you know, they had a forward uh, force and they bumped into a, um, a force of um, the tribals. And um, they got captured. They got, they got overrun. There was 500,000 people, they reckon, in this, in this tribal camp. You know, half a million people. These numbers are insane, really, you know, which we're talking about. And the amount of people dying in one day. We're, we're almost going to World War One levels, you know, of battles. Right. And um, I, That's what I was thinking when you were throwing those numbers out there. Yeah. And uh, they they captured the um, I think it was a legate. It was a legate leading this small troop, uh, bunch of troops, and uh, it was, I think they were led. The tribes were led by this king, King Boy, Boisox, something like that, something like that. And he uh, he met the king and said, you, "Look, you need to retreat before we uh, we kill all of you." You know, referring to the Romans. So uh, he was he wasn't very impressed by the legate's uh, lack of humility for being caught, and he ended up. Putting him in a wicker basket and slowly roasting him. Nice. So, you know, you got, you got stuff like that. And then when these guys won as well, you know, they were killing your women and children. They they weren't. Oh, yeah. And these then they guys were, were brutal. Saving as well. Well, they would go Roman on you, is the old term, yeah. and that's you know, it's it's actually pretty smart because you, you, once they come through, you didn't want to mess with them anymore. Yeah. So you would just had the threat that a Roman legion was coming towards you and they, most of the enemy would flee and they wouldn't mm -hmm. have any resistance. And that's kind of the tactic that Marius, uh, it was, you know, no prisoners, uh, loot and pillage. Um, the problem with that tactic, uh, like uh, Hare H from World War II, we don't want to get banned. Uh, see, he tried that on Great Britain. He thought, well, we'll just pummel them. Well, it just comes home eventually and it gets turned around on you. It's like karma. And yeah. uh, then you get brutalized sooner or later. It may take a couple hundred years, but sooner or later you get brutalized. It's the same as um, whenever you uh, kind of surround an enemy and put their back against the wall, you know. It's always best to let – to give them kind of some way of escape, isn't it? You know, right. always they'll just fight harder. Right. You're better off beating them soundly and just uh, like – they eventually came to that policy where they would just, because there's so much horrific losses, they had to start taking in the cap, the, uh, the conquered peoples and rolling yeah. them into part of the empire. Right. Yeah. And they had to incorporate them in. So this is part of the whole process that went on for hundreds of years, um, just by trial and error really. Uh, and by necessity, because, Hey, I need more troops for my ranks. I got to use enemy troops. Now I'm going to make them Roman troops. Like you said, like auxiliaries. Um, and, you know, we had some of that. We had, uh, I had some auxiliary Celts fighting with my Romans and this and that and some other games. Yeah, that's, that's good. You don't see that much, but that's definitely accurate, especially with um, use of foreign, foreign cavalry, you know, like New Midians, we used a lot for their cavalry. So, you know, sometimes you might have two thirds of your Roman cavalry actually be, uh, you know, um, tribal. With no, you know, with with no, uh, you would you'd never guess they were Roman. You know, maybe maybe they're given a shield or something to identify them. You know, right? And they would uh, they would fight based on the fact that the Romans would say, "Hey, we're going to let you basically help run things. We'll yeah. be here as some a little muscle. We'll leave a fort with some muscle around." And uh, it was became a power play amongst the the chieftains. You know, this guy would side with the Romans because he just basically weighed things out and said, "I think probably the Romans are going to end up winning this long term, so I'm going to side with them." Yeah. So there's all this intrigue and things that can go on, guys, with these scenarios you can play out um, with any of the, the war games we play. That's to me, um, and that's what I'm working on for this coming Saturday's game is having some kind of cool scenario, some kind of objective. Uh, instead of just rolling dice and just taking off, you know, killing each other, there's got to be some kind of point to the yeah. game. I would like uh, to um, do some sort of scenario where using my ancient Britons, kind of representing the Roman invasion of Britain, where there was almost like a guerrilla warfare kind of um, tactics used. So maybe you could have a full-size um, <clears throat> German uh, army on the table. And then perhaps, you only, and perhaps they've got to take a certain path or get somewhere. Um, but <clears throat> obviously then you can have, um, the British 
sorry, oh, the English, I don't know what you'd even call them at this time, the British tribes come in there piecemeal, you know, so you're only going to add small bits on, but eventually you're allowed a larger force if you add them all up, but they're only allowed to come in piecemeal or something like that, you know. And maybe right. they can deploy a lot quicker, a lot sooner, or a lot further, further closer. All right, and there's Philip, my buddy Philip. Uh, he makes a good point here. He's throwing out the statistic of 25% of the cavalry was Roman. There you go, yeah. So we're talking either they made deals or they gave them, you know, jewels, cash, you know, coinage. Uh, when we come to find out that the Romans were also starting to be like the central banks today, they, they started plating their coins. They were basically lead, right? And they would just plate the coins. So yeah, oh, no. I mean, there's all kinds of bribery going on, all kinds of intrigue. And uh, and I remember that battle which we described where the oh the, sorry the first battle that Marius had against the Kimbri, his cavalry actually came in uh, quite important there. You know, I think so the two lines clashed, and uh, the Kimbri were actually pushing back on the Romans. You know, had it just been that infantry fight in the, in the middle, I think the Romans would have uh, eventually succumbed to the pressure. But um, it was actually, but but he sent he sent his Roman cavalry forward on both sides to engage with the enemy cavalry. So eventually, when they won that cavalry battle, they they could then come back in and hammer and anvil the line. So it was quite a, you know quite a basic kind of um, battle how it played out. You know, putting putting your cavalry on both flanks, sending them forward, defeating the enemy cavalry, and then just bringing them round. Like the, the zoom, is like the horns. Yeah, but that but that you know that wiped out them all. You know, it was. Uh, not many, not many people left after that. All right. And anybody else out there who's watching, if you want to chime in on some of the tactics, military tactics that were developed over this period mm -hmm. from, you know, more basic block formations. I think uh, Marius, uh, guys, Marius completely reorganized <clears throat> their, their fighting strategy too. Um, yeah. Let me go back to the article here. I wasn't where sure, he, I wasn't sure if uh, the, if the pillum was just started to be used more after this, after the Republican period, um, well, it says that uh, the, what I've read, he improved it. So, yeah. um, it didn't really go into the improvements <laughs> if they, he just made it so that they were more, um, I think it was that, that it could bend. So the enemy couldn't use it. The, back soft, against the metal on the, uh, on the end. So it's stuck in the shield. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it would basically dis disarm you because your shield, you'd basically throw it down. And now you're open to uh, yeah. so to sword attack. And I think it was, and we also saw um, <clears throat> the complete removal of um, any. You, I think you still had um, what's the short spear that the Greeks had? Hoplites. I think you saw there was still in the Republican period the use of hoplites. You know, like the triarii. And I think they eventually just got rid of the um, the short spear pretty much completely. Um, you know, replaced it with the short sword, the gladius. You know. Yeah, and it was it was just more of a thrusting sword. It really wasn't good good at yeah. cutting, but it was for just th lunging into your your gut. They didn't want to go for your yeah. chest because because it would get stuck in your ribs. But uh, that was all it was. It was they wanted. Well, they to did a lot of uh, they did the groin as well, the upper thrust into the groin, which is particularly nasty. Yes, and then they would. <laughs> they would change that front rank would get tired. They would fall back. The next yeah. rank would come up. It was I basically wondered, I wondered how that would actually work in the battle though. You know, if you're engaged and then actually and the other line coming in and so many, so many historians have debated how that actually, you know, worked. Right. That comes down to the training and they just, they just figured it out. Here we go. We've got another comment from Philip here. Marius changed it from a trained militia to a professional. Yeah. Army. Correct. There they go, yeah. um, and, does the training they would someone was having to give some kind of command so you'd had to have a centurion or someone in the back that was barking an a specific one word order and he would say this mm -hmm. move forward move yeah. back and they, they had maybe a drummer possibly i don't know this is where guys can maybe have done some reenactment with roman uh stuff um maybe a drum boom boom and after like two or three beats, maybe they shifted. It's hard to say exactly. Um, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of horns being used next to the centurion, in, in particularly in uh, the modeling world, you know, those long horn things. Right. Horn. There you go. Philip's saying it is horn. So they go. Yeah. And boom. The next line would come up. 
they would fight for a period of time. Centurion was probably standing next to the hornblower, the hornblower, Horatio hornblower. Yeah. <laughs> and he would say, and the next yeah. line would move up. That's actually good because you figure with the voice, even if the guy had a good, strong voice, it was limited, but that horn was piercing and it was, it was. Oh, uh, and you, and imagine the noises and the loudness at the front, at the front line, you know, so right. they, I think you still had a lot of shield wall type type fighting as well then, you know, so right. a lot of flashing and banging of shields. And then you had obviously the Kimbri themselves used to make what inf- well, famous for making such a terrible noise on the battlefield, trying to spook out the Romans. But the first time the Romans met the, um, the camp of the Kimbri, they, you know, they, they lit double the amount of fires on the hill. So it looked like there was a million of them rather than 500,000. And then, um, as I say, they used to stretch their, um, their animal skins over, over, they turned the wagons on their side, stretched the animal skins over them and just used to beat them. Apparently it made a really alien like, you know, uh, creepy noise that, that kept the Romans up all night. It's quite cool, you know? <laughs> well, and you figure too, I mean, this, this period, they were just, they, this is the genius of as like anything in this, in this uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So as they encountered a problem in battle, they would come back to the camp and try to figure out a way to make it better so that it was more efficient. And you figure this is the whole beginnings of communicating on the battlefield with the, the, the signal corps, the flags, the, the, the bugles, the trumpets, mm. all the things that they would use to communicate orders. And that's what is great about, well, sometimes it's not so great when you're playing Hail Caesar or even black powder because you have to roll for that command dice, man. Yeah. And there's been many a game where I've got blocks of troops. I can't get them to do anything because yeah. I didn't make my command roll. And now my troops are sitting there and I can't get them to attack or move. So that's where that part of the rule simulates that where, you know, in the heat of battle yeah. and the dust and the fog. In the second world war, we have a, we have a radio, you know, Yes. Talk directly to that unit commander. And in World War One, they used, that's why it was so important to have good quality watches. You know, they, they would go back to, let's say, the command center and they'd say, at three o'clock, you guys are doing this. At 3.15, your group does this. It was all done by time a lot of times. And it would go, the whole attack would come down just by uh, using your, your uh, watch, the you know, the, the lieutenant would be looking at his watch and he would shoot his flare gun. It's my time for my guys to go. Yeah. And that's where a lot of guys were get killed by friendly fire because there may have been a mix up. Hey, maybe some guy had a fast watch or a slow watch yeah. and he started his artillery barrage a little too early when the other guys had just started an attack. And then they, yeah, I mean, that's, the, like, that's the last thing the officers would do before, uh, when their last meeting, they'd all set their watches together, you know? They'd all set their watches just before they left the meeting room. Right. And you see it in like something like Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings movies. The the orcs were up on a high point with flags sending out signals to the other orcs when to attack, when to fall Talking back. That, is it I heard uh is there is there a new one coming out? Something about the uh pre the prequel or something like that? Well, it's essentially Amazon has paid a, a shit ton of money. Um there it's in production. There's a lot of you. If you guys want to go over to Nerd Roddick uh, on uh, on YouTube, he talks about it quite a bit. Uh, some of the stuff that's filtering out, some of the rumors about this. Uh, it's a it's a series. I think they're going to do twenty some episodes. It's costing a shit ton of money. Hmm. Uh, everyone's worried that it's going to be woke. You know, oh, you're gonna have a lot yeah. of woke, you have a lot of wokeism creeping into this thing. I mean, at least it's not Disney doing it, but you know, even that Disney production right. was still pretty good. <laughs> the Mandalorian was still pretty good, I think. You know, right? But this is a common theme in our wargaming guys coming from the Romans, whether it's Civil War, I don't care what it is. It is a lot of rules, and Hail Caesar, uh, Black Powder, pretty good at it. I think it's a good system. It's nice and straightforward. It's based on how many. Uh, uh, commanders and your commander has to be within a certain uh, distance of the troops he's commanding. Yeah, so so, so where you choose to be your commander is important decision, isn't it? You and that look. When I was fighting Philip with the Macedonians, I found out real fast you have to have enough commanders on the field, so you get better command roles. Um, because my my Romans were just sitting there, and the Macedonians basically just wiped them out with their cavalry. 
So, uh, yeah, I found out real fast how to deal with Macedon, not to deal with Macedonians, um, because, uh, they're pretty lethal, uh, on the tabletop. So, uh, yeah, so this is the fun of the hobby guys is not just the modeling and stuff, of course, but doing this research like this and trying to come up with some scenarios, I'm still going to be working at tomorrow when I get home from work, how I'm going to set up the battlefield for Philip and I, and, um, kind of trying to come up with some kind of scenario. And that's why it's important. I think any era you're gaming guys, including the Roman Roman period is to purchase some kits of civilians. Um, you know, you can have the damsels in distress. You can have the villagers because you can have that as a big part of your scenario is, Hey, here's a village that maybe the, um, the Celts are, are protecting. Um, and, uh, or you have a damsel in distress you're trying to maybe rescue. There can come up with all kinds of things. There could be a bridge that you're trying to take if someone you have control over a bridge. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things you can take from history and make your own little scenario. Uh, to, yeah, to or, you, or you could have the flavor. A certain amount of uh, civilians are killed. Uh, you know, it affects morale in one, in one of the sides, something like that, you know. Well, Rob had a game a couple years back at his place it was world war ii we were playing a battle group and one of the things that was there was a road running up the entire middle of the board it was a big board and we're talking 12 footer and it was refugees there's all these refugees on the road right so uh you couldn't use the road because it was clogged with refugees so you had to use either coming through the woods or coming through marshes and things that would slow down your units and then uh there was a German plane that would come every round that we'd roll for, and he would strafe the friggin' refugees. <laughs> oh, it's like a, it's like that that awful thing that happened in, in the Middle East. I think it was the first Gulf War or something like that. When that that was happening, you know, and right? You know, that's a big part of a warfare. People forget that, yes. don't they? The, the baggage trains, the civilians. Yes. Try trying a lot of time trying to protect their civilians or baggage train or lots of wars and battles are based around that, aren't they? Correct. And that's why that's a great element to add. And then most of the companies, Warlord and all them, they sell, sell kits and there's third party companies out there that you can get resin kits or pewter kits uh, that will give you the civilians you need as the cannon fodder floating around or people that need rescued or whatever. Um, so I just watched the, the, the Rambo where around uh, John Rambo is he's uh, going to help the missionaries that he delivered on his boat. I don't know if you guys remember that one. It was uh, the most recent Rambo movie, but now it's a, like a killer scenario. If you're playing like Vietnam era, um, you got some missionaries you need to save. Um, I mean, you can just use your imagination. I think that's what really adds to the games. And that's why these, these uh, skirmish games are becoming so popular uh, like with Le Star Wars Legion, and you've got the skirmish level games. I forget. Uh, eh, I'm pretty sure Two Fat Lardies has one that they just came out with that's for this ancient period. It's more skirmish level, so you can have a, a, a group of Roman soldiers roaming the countryside looking for food. They come upon a village. Um, they think they're going to bully on the villagers, but s suddenly, you know, a group of Celts appear. And then they start to fight each other. Uh, yeah. over, I think, over I think the skirmish size, you can definitely have more fun with, with the uh, scenarios. Correct. Infamy, infamy. That's it. Thanks, Philip. Yeah. Infamy, infamy. So this, there's a lot. That's the big trend right now, I think, especially younger guys who don't have the cash, the expendable disposable income to get into these big armies. All the tabletop space. And it's not just that. It's having the big table and it's having the – uh, you get bogged down in some of these big armies, man. It can take months uh, to get everything painted and built. Uh, so it can become a, a drag sometimes um, painting these big armies like I've got collected over the years. But um, and I'm, I'm still looking at Civil War. You know, that's my probably my maybe one of my last big uh, paint, you know, build paint jobs outside of now that I'm rereading Lord of the Rings uh, series of books. I just purchased uh, some hardbacks with illustrations. They're kind of collectible. Um, mm -hmm. now I want to get, now I'm like scanning for, uh, Lord of the Rings kits. And I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. 
Yeah, yeah. You, that's the thing. You get t- you get other shit it, that yeah. I have on my plate, but it, that's kind of how you can get sucked into this. And next 100%. thing you know, what do they call it? The 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 uh, the the pile of shame where you got piles of model kits, or even, or even just even it's just a war gaming magazine, or and just seeing a certain thing, it just you want it, don't you? <laughs> All right, so here we go. Indiana Stug says the Indiana Jones uh, sort of t- exactly, and I think I'm pretty sure there's a company out there that produces some Indiana Jones type stuff. And then there's Mythic Americas, I think that Warlord has, where you got some of the Incas, and it's more of a off the off kind of a, a wacky, weird um, South American flavor yeah. kind of game system that's out there. So there's more of this stuff creeping into the industry. Uh, where you can like with uh, Legion is a perfect example because you can come up with all kinds of scenarios with C3PO or Princess Leia and all kinds of you know rescue missions and mm. kinds of things like that. Um, places of the world and every game is like an old serial episodes, right? Yeah, Frostgrave type adaptation. Yeah, that's a good. That's supposed to be a good rule system, Frostgrave, and they got some really good model kits. I've heard. So yeah, I mean, this is what we you were talking about Romans, and we kind of we, you can get off, and we can you can you can do hybrid games too. Like if I know a lot of guys now, I haven't done it with these, um, and you can buy bases, these size bases that you can put individual troops on. So you can either use some of your troops for skirmish and then you can rank them back up to use for your large battles yeah. so it's a good way to model if you're, cool, if you're doing a model they've got some cool dark age stuff on there as well <clears throat> you know if you're not playing that stuff where you know if you're looking at like i don't know the vikings stuff you know when the vikings were raiding right, Britain, Daga. they were quite small amounts of troops they were using at the time you know historically they weren't these yeah. big battles with thousands of thousands they were pretty much skirmishes you know Right, and that's what the the saga is huge. I have not delved into sa- saga. Yeah. Um, so you could, but, if, if you wanted to, you know, stay in low on troop number, you could definitely look at something like the Vikings. You know that period. I think Philip was mentioning recently. I was chatting with him about uh, there's a tournament coming up. He's uh, was that was that saga, Philip? I think I think you said it was saga. Uh, he was preparing a, a faction that he was going to take to a tournament to play in a tournament. Gotcha. Um, so that I know it's creeping into the tournament scene now. It's not just Flames of War and the big name, um, the big name companies are are really getting more into skirmish. Late Imperial Roman also had very small armies. Yeah, Saga. So yeah, it is, he is preparing a faction to to uh, take the tournament. That's huge now. A lot of guys are playing Saga. Um, I know. Uh, Zach, one of our gamers that comes to the Wargaming Den here, he he uh, plays Saga quite a bit. Um, and again, the the the, uh, the other big appeal, guys, is it's smaller model count. Uh, you can really collect more factions. Um, and you're just not got the time and investment of the figs like you do with these large systems. Um, you know, yeah, you can get to that at some point uh, in your gaming career. <laughs> And you've got, you, so I'm just reading about the saga system. So you, you've got fake cards, it says, which determine the effects of actions. Is that the right system? Uh, saga, I think they do have cards. Philip, you want to yeah. chime in here? I have never played it. Um, I know Zach a year or so ago was trying to talk me into getting into saga, and it was just, I just had too much on my plate. Yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard learning a whole entire new rule set it's, uh, and remembering all the ones you, you need to remember as well. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of them are even using just regular cards, like regular poker cards um, that you can draw from. So there's a lot out there. A lot of the skirmish games are coming out with uh, card systems. It increases the randomness and things that can happen during the game um, out of the blue. Um, you know, there's guys that have taken uh, Hail Caesar, and they make their own card system uh, so yeah. to, to introduce some randomness. Uh, yeah. to what's happening on the battlefield so yeah. here you go simon's chiming in here got three saga age of viking armies and two age of hannibal not too many figures to paint for an army that's the mm. thing so it's more manageable because i can tell you even with my star wars legion which hey i i made the mistake of at christmas i just started 
Guys, never drink an Amazon. Just oh, don't do it. What a nightmare. <laughs> don't do it. Next thing you know, you got piles of boxes on the front porch. Yeah. And you're like, what the hell did I do? Yeah. Um, Saga uses a battle board with dice you put on abilities. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah, that's another one out there, guys. If you're stumbling onto this video and you're looking for a game system, get in and you like ancients um, and you like the Viking, Viking period. Um, or this, I think they delve not just Vikings. They've gotten, like he said, more into even Hannibal type uh, armies. You can do yeah, Roman armies, yeah. or I shouldn't say armies. I should say factions. So you got maybe ten models, fifteen models, twelve models. So and, they, they, do, they cover Celts, Iberians, Numidians, mm -hmm. Italian tribes. Yeah, it looks like they've got a mixture there. And it's just keeps yeah, anything around the Hannibal Barker period. Yeah. And they've got other, they've also got other soccer ages as well, soccer ages. Right. And it's so much more manageable doing skirmish guys. Uh, yeah. As you, you, you just want to put a feather in your cap and say, Hey, I've got mass ar armies out here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's harder. I mean, it, you, you got to get, you really have to need to have a couple of guys playing another, another couple of guys and you really have to dedicate an entire afternoon. Um, the, the, there's, there's, Definitely, that's a, a place to graduate to at some point with your wargaming. That's definitely a goal. But I, I'm finding myself being drawn more to the skirmish type games because of the fact that it's they're quicker to play, less cost. It's so much quicker to paint a force and get it to a tournament, like in Philip's case, or just to say, hey, man, come over next Saturday. Let's throw some dice. We'll throw some hamburgers on the grill kind of thing. Yeah. And you're only playing for a couple of hours, right? And it's not taking up the entire day. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's hard to get a group of guys. I can speak now from experience because a year ago I wasn't in that position to have a place to play uh, where I could have a group of guys come. But it's, everyone is so busy these days, guys. And with COVID, the dreaded C word. Especially um, when you're, learning, you're still learning the rule set or something. There's a lot of stopping and starting anyway. Right. And you got to have a guy or two that really know the rules well yeah. enough. And then you're typically that first hour is kind of a learning curve with the rules. Even if you're playing once a month, like we do, uh, we'll play a, a rule set. And then three or four months later, we're back into that rule set. Well, it takes about an hour just to refresh yourself uh, on the rules. Um, so there's all those aspects too. And these guys that I've, I envy some of these guys in the UK. They've you really got a great club system where they've got these killer clubs. They'll go to a local municipal building and uh, once a month and play something that the that the club decides they're going to play. So, and usually one of the club members will host the game and he'll be in charge of interpreting the rules, etc. But I think that's a great system to have for the big games. Mm. Uh, but it's also nice to just. Um, and we're seeing that over here in the U S too, the, the, like the pub games. So skirmish, you go and you just get a table at a outdoor area at a restaurant and you sit out there and play some games. Uh, and there's even game pubs that are popping up. So until the C hit, the big C hit, it put a lot of them out of business. Um, so yeah, um, we're coming up on to an hour. I'm probably going to want to, um, Keep this about to an hour. Um, yeah, sure. I'm in charge sure, of making yeah, dinner tonight. Yeah. So. You guys have been getting to a lot. 8 p.m. over there in the UK? 8 p.m., yeah. That's it. So, uh, it's starting to get dark now in the evenings. You know, month yeah, ago, it's, it's that was that time of year. The days are getting shorter. You're like, man, we're already back going into winter. Uh, getting the old day of rain again now. Yeah, see, the population in the UK is a lot more condensed as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and then Philip, he's a trooper. He comes uh, f from a city in the west side of Ohio. And, you know, this is the thing because everyone's so busy and there's so much going on. And uh, with all of our, those of us that are able to get out and still work uh, on a regular basis, we're just being, those of us that are able to still work are still getting bombarded. Uh, supply shortages, et cetera, et cetera. It puts a lot more strain on on the, your, uh, oh, these on your supply job. Shortages, these supply shortages are unbelievable. Oh. We're, we're in printing, and um, we you know we we have to print a big job, uh, and we just our paper costs have gone through the roof. You know the price of timber's gone up, and 
and so and actually in the, the haulage in the uk is in a real disaster at the moment so getting stuff is a real is a real nightmare at the moment supply issue right and guys like me i've been in my business over 30 years so i'm in a lot better position and i've got a building that i can stock up when i when i when things were looking like they would be that way i stocked up on fertilizer and well this is the thing i had a customer i don't normally do seeding jobs but she talked me into it but she's an old customer but it was hard there i had to search and scrummage around for a week just to get grass seed um, because it's in short supply i mean everything is stretched to the limits one of the things in my industry was this past spring, luckily, I took a truckload, so I was in in a good position with uh, product. But they didn't have skids because of the skids are made out of pine, and there was a lumber shortage and a lumber spike. Well, they were producing fertilizer and bagging fertilizer for use throughout agriculture, but they couldn't put a. There was no skids to put the fertilizer on, so it could <clears> even <throat> be delivered. Right. I say, yeah. You don't think about these kinds of things. So some one little thing, something as simple as a skid that they put stuff on it for bulk deliveries. And I, I get bulk deliveries. A guy yeah. comes with a forklift and loads it into my building for me. And you know, we're talking tons of fertilizer at a time, tons, you know, we're not buying bags here. We're buying mm-hmm. tons. So when you don't have those things, the, these little things that interrupt, like, Hey, we can't find any truck drivers. That's the other things going on over here. They got, oh, yeah, we've got a massive problem with that at the moment. Product coming in from either China or Europe. And that's just sitting in a ship because there's nobody yeah. to haul it. Yeah. A lot, of my, a lot of my orders have been weeks late, you know. It's just uh, – it, they've almost been warning us about this for a while, so it's just starting to come to fruition now, you know. And we talk about the strain on the gaming. You guys get stuck. You literally go – like I was – for five months, I was stuck down here. I was literally going batshit crazy because – I couldn't really go anywhere. You can't really oh, yeah. do anything. It's cold outside. And the strain it's put on everyone, not just the fact that the worries and the uh, other things that can come into your mind and the other things that it puts strains on relationships. Um, it, 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 the damage that has been done has reverberated through all of our society. And thank God we had Philip and Paul and Joe and them guys coming over here. Cause it was like, Oh my God, I can actually freaking yeah. talk to someone face to face. There's a great <laughs> community on, uh, on discord as well. So. Right. And it's just reverberated all the way through. So hopefully, you know, we can get past some of this and uh, start coming to our senses. Yeah. And uh, get, get some painting done in the winter. In the autumn. Do some painting. And uh, I tell you what, man, If even if I have to wear a freaking mask, I'm going to the mall just to walk around. I got to get out of this house. I just can't do it. And now I'm planning, currently planning to be at least two weeks in Florida this January. And uh, I'll make some videos, put some stuff up, what I'm up to on my other channel, exploring with the Smiths. Driver shortage, container shortage. It's crazy. We we're even caught in the Australia-China trade war with wine supplies. Interesting. I can't think of anything worse, not bound to get your wine in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, look, man, it's uh, look, and that's what I was saying at the start of the podcast, guys. It was nice to have guys reach out. And I think that's something we all need to keep in mind if we see somebody hasn't been on here for a while that's usually contributing. It doesn't hurt to go over to the private messenger on, on our Discord and say, hey, what's up? Haven't seen you for a while. How are things going? Um, Sometimes that can make all the difference uh, when somebody's in a bad place, right? Because that that's is happening. It's been happening, and um, we we all just need to stick together uh, through this and give each other some support if we need it. Um, and uh, it's it's easy to to get discouraged and say, "Man, nobody cares anymore." <laughs> but there are there's a lot of guys that care there's a lot of people out there that care there's a lot of good people out there we all need to focus on that guys before we leave the podcast here there's more good than there is bad and it's easy to get caught up in just the bad and something i have learned this year with the guys coming over here the game philip being one of them is um there's a lot of us that think alike we have a lot more in common than we have uncommon uh, that's what I found this year. When you actually get to sit down and actually speak to people like this platform allows us to do, um, 
you find that there's a lot of uh, uh, similarities and a lot of agreement on things, and uh, that that that's a that's a position of uh, strength because you need to figure out, I'm not alone, right? There's other people that think like me yeah. and do things like me, and that's you know, guys, that's how the enemy attacks. Guys, he 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 gets you off by yourself like a freaking buffalo herd. You know, they get that wolf pack gets that buffalo off by himself. And that's where he's easy to pick off that little buffalo all by himself. Yeah, I can't find my Alaskan beer anywhere. Damn it. Alaskan beer. <laughs> Pubs here struggle to get beer or the CO2 as well. Interesting. Yeah, so I won't get into, into that. But I was drinking that damn, I was telling Sammy the other day, that damn Scottish ale I was pounding. Um, Scottish ale. I think it was like 18%. I think, don't they call that, I think over here they call it heavy. It's like, oh, yeah. it's heavy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's thick. Um, it's a sipping beer, I call it. And sometimes sure. you don't sip it, and then you get into trouble. I like um, if we're talking about beer. I like the uh, Bavarian wheat beer or the German, oh, or German wheat beer. Right. That it, it, it gets a bit. It gets a bit of a strong taste after two or three, but it's. Uh, I love it. You know. Right, and you know, um, yeah, children, remember everything in moderation. Yeah, everything in moderation. Um, a lot of sipping. Uh, bring back my legions. I mean, beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it's, 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 look, like I said, guys, we got to stick together. Uh, we got a nice little community here, 35 people, but everybody's in other groups too. So if you got guys in other groups, it, it doesn't matter. This isn't a competition, but sometimes you get your sixth sense. I have a guy that, uh, he makes some of the products that I use uh, for, for gaming here, gaming supplies. Um, I'll keep them anonymous, but he even reached out to me. He's like, dude, where have you been? You're not making videos. <laughs> and you, it's it's nice to be uh, uh, missed. I know Stug disappeared there for a little while, didn't you, Stug? I was like, what the hell happened to Stug? Well, he's living life, man. He's a young guy. Got a lot going on. Yeah. But it's good to reach out. Say, hey, is everything okay? If you, Do you need to talk about anything? And uh, hopefully Rocky, Rocky's War Room. Rocky, if you're watching this on a replay, uh, we miss you. Uh, but do your thing, man. Do, go your path. Do your path. And uh, we'll look forward to you coming back to the community. You're welcome on my podcast anytime. I was a guest on his podcast, I think, three weeks ago. Um, and was looking forward Check to doing other podcasts. And he just checked out. He said, you know, I got to focus on some other things right now. So, um, yeah, young buck. Correct. Damn, if I could just go back to 20, knowing what I know now, though, that's the catch. Youth is wasted in the young. <laughs> I would go back to 20 if I can retain the information in my oh, head. Oh, yeah. Right. Then it would be it would be ridiculous what I would do. All right. So, uh, all right, guys, I'm going to let everybody go. Um, I'm going to go upstairs and start getting dinner prepped, um, et cetera, et cetera. My wife is visiting a couple of sisters today north of here. So when she comes home, I'm going to have dinner cooking. And uh, anybody else? Or you have any other closing thoughts, Sammy, you would like to put out to the community? Uh, any pearls of wisdom? Any of the things that, like I've talked about, that you've learned over the last year? A little pearl of wisdom you want to throw out there? I put me on the spot now, but <laughs> right. not really. Just keep on trucking, really. You know, right. we're going in and out hobbies. Um, I think this is, for me, certainly more of a... Um, autumn and winter hobby so i'll probably be a bit more active in the uh in the group um so yeah I th I, I, it's nice to get back into a podcast with you um, i'm looking forward to you know doing the next one if, whenever you want to do it and uh if anyone else wants to join anyone else has got anything to suggest then it'll always be interesting to hear you know right guys that's a great point don't be shy man get on there i i can just send you a link all you need is a cell phone you don't need anything fancy you don't even need to show your face. You can have that little talking blurb that goes bop, 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 bop. So that's that's cool. I mean, uh, that's a good point. So anybody have any ideas to bring it to the group? Say, hey, I, I would love to see a podcast and we could talk about X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Um, and uh, we can get that done. Uh, now we can get back in the saddle here and get galloping forward, moving forward again. Uh, but thanks again for coming today, Sammy. Uh, we've missed you. Okay. And uh, I'll be in touch. 100%. Take care, everyone. Later, guys.